Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 177th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Sarah Stanich. Sarah is the founder of Cultivating Wealth, an independent RIA based in the New York City area that oversees nearly 50 million of assets under management for 95 ongoing client households. What's unique about Sarah, though, is the way she transitioned into the world of financial advice as a career changer in the midst of the financial crisis and the last bear market which ultimately forced her into the independent channel with less support but more flexibility to build the business at her own pace, which in the end made it easier for Sarah to craft the advisory firm she ultimately wanted to. In this episode, we talk in depth about Sarah's journey through the advisory industry, why she initially started out in a major wirehouse for their training program, what led her to initially skip out on the independent RIA channel and make a switch to the independent broker-dealer channel instead, but still choosing one with had more independence, even if it meant a little less salary based in training. Why she ultimately made the decision to switch to the RIA channel six years later anyway, though, because of how much the support structures for independent RIAs had changed and developed during the decade of the 2010s. We also talk about how Sarah built her business and gets clients, the way in the early days she obtained both her CFP certification and the CDFA designation to go deeper into the divorce niche, how she tried to take advantage of opportunities to buy out what were C clients for other advisors in her branch, but A clients for her early practice, the way today she uses data points, a software service to provide prospects with a wealth building assessment to understand themselves better and identify who may be a good fit for the firm, and the three simple things that Sarah includes in her monthly newsletter to prospects to stay in front of them for future business opportunities. And be certain to listen to the end, where Sarah shares how the business has evolved in recent years as she's begun to add more CFP professionals to her team, how she kept her confidence through the early years by focusing on the progress she was making, even if the dollars took years to add up to what she'd been making in the past before pulling ahead, and her key advice to career changers and other advisors early in their careers who may be struggling in the firm or platform where they're currently at. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Sarah Stanich. Welcome, Sarah Stanich, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thanks, Michael. I'm looking forward to today's episode and, and talking about just what it takes to build an advisory firm in your own client base, especially when you're career change into the industry and do so in the midst of a, a difficult economic and market environment. I know you came to the industry with an interesting background because you you lived a world of doing marketing for a long time before coming an advisor and, and then made a career change to take the leap right in the face of the last bear market that came with the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis. It's hard enough to get clients when times are good and people are just trying to decide which advisor to work with, never mind when markets in the economy are bad and and we're just trying to get prospective clients to take their heads out of the sand. So I'm looking forward to a discussion of just how how you tackled this in in the last bear market cycle and and what it was like coming to the table with with a a background in marketing. I I think something that most of us advisors struggle with. We we may be good at sales, but we, we tend to struggle with marketing. So as we get started, I'm just wondering what your impression was of the advisor world when you started getting trained and and taught how to get clients given the background you had? I mean, did you even see what you were expecting to see in the industry as you made the career change in? Yeah, I did. And just to take a step back on the marketing, something you said just kind of reminded me (laughs) of, you know, my background in in marketing. I'd done sort of sales and marketing jobs as well, you know, as a young person. And then I worked for an online marketing agency starting in like 1997. So it was like really early when, you know, banner ads and things were. Say like back in the dark ages, did you buy ads on GeoCities? Like I did. <laughs> Fantastic. That's awesome. I did. I did. I had some cool clients and I, and I did everything there. I was a digital marketing coordinator and then I was a media planner and then account manager for a team and, you know, graphic designers and, you know, websites and online tracking, all that, all that kind of stuff. 
so that was really interesting. We had some big clients too, like Disney. And anyway, yeah. So I worked in an online marketing agency and then I wanted like a more varied marketing background. I worked in market research for a company. I did sales for them, but it was a company that did like focus groups. And so kind of, you know, really deep, like qualitative marketing. And then, you know, when you're on the agency side, a lot of times you work really long hours, you're kind of like committed to the client. Well, I wanted, I wanted to be the client. <laughs> and so I wanted to be like on the corporate side. And I was director of marketing at a Fortune 500 company that actually sold construction equipment. So it was like very, you know, male dominated industry. Okay. And, you know, then from being there, it was time to make a change, but I wanted to, and I also during that time got an MBA at New York University, but I wanted to use the marketing experience I had to build my own business, like as opposed to building someone else's business. Okay. And so I think that that's something that a lot, you know, that sort of entrepreneurial spirit is definitely something a lot of advisors have as well. So maybe I have like a few more tools to, to apply to it, but. And so is that part of what led you to advisor world? Like I, okay, I know some marketing stuff. I want to build a thing where I build my own business. Hey, advising sounds good because you get to build your own thing. Like, was that, was that drew you in that direction? Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely always a very independent person. So I was looking for, I was looking for a career change and I was looking for something where I could kind of cut my own path. And I had spent a lot of time on, you know, my own financial planning trials and tribulations, you know, dealing with debt. And I bought an apartment in New York city and, you know, kind of figuring that stuff out as a, you know, getting my MBA. I knew a lot of people in the finance industry, you know, kind of figuring that stuff out on my own. I thought it would be something that I was good, good at. And also I, I knew I was good at working with clients because I had been an account manager. I'd always been like the person that was in charge of like re- managing relationships. So financial planning, there's a lot in common with that. So for you, it wasn't necessarily the it wasn't the financial part of financial advisor that was drawing you in. It was more the advisor part and the opportunity to build known a business in which you get to develop and manage relationships because that was the skill set you were good at and enjoy. Definitely. Like I wasn't intimidated by the investing part. So maybe that's, you know, key to it is I felt capable of that, but I didn't get into it because of like a love of trading or, you know, mutual fund research. (laughs) So, so you decided I want to make this shift. I've spent 10 odd years in the marketing world, digital marketing, marketing research, director of marketing, doing construction equipment. I'm going to make this leap into financial advisor world because I like the opportunity to develop and manage relationships and, and have something that I'm building for myself. So How did you come at the industry at that point when you decided, hey, I think I want to go in this direction? How did you approach it? What were you looking at? Oh, I just, you know, I knew I was looking for a change. And I I started talking to people from networking, kind of informational interview type conversations. And some were with people that I knew through my MBA program. One friend said, you know, I have this friend, you would be so good at being a financial advisor. I have this friend, he's really successful at Merrill Lynch and he is about as smooth as sandpaper. <laughs> you'd, you'd be so, you'd actually be so much better at this than he would. If he's <laughs> succeeding at Merrill Lynch, you are going to crush it. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. So I kind of did an informational interview with this guy and this was at like at the time was the biggest branch at Merrill Lynch. It was like the Fifth Avenue branch, like Fifth Avenue and 55th Street. And I think there were 140 advisors in the office. There were four floors. Wow. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a big office. And, you know, I did an informational interview with him. And then he introduced me to the branch manager. And then, you know, they called me back for some interviews. And, and I also, I think I also maybe talked to somebody else in that time too, but then, you know, I liked 
I, I went with the Merrill Lynch people in 2007. And so that was in like the summer of 2007. It was kind of like the peak of the market. <laughs> so good timing, good timing. Yeah. And so they had like a training program class there and, and it, it was very different for me. I mean, I, I definitely did, you know, kind of get myself into something I wasn't expecting. Like everything I had read, like, oh, financial advisor, you can, you know, you can be so independent and, and help clients. And, you know, there were all these things about it that I was interested in. And then I got there and I was in this like sort of training class with maybe like 20 other, you know, mostly like younger guys, right, in their 20s. Right. And like, just like kind of realized, I was like, oh, I'm at like the bottom of the totem pole in this office now. <laughs> and, you know. Which is a challenge. Like when you're a career changer coming in, like I was in a position of some authority and responsibility. And I now find myself in the bullpen with the recent college grads. Like not yeah. trying to knock recent college grads coming in. But if you've gotten a ways down your career path already in somewhere else, like that's a bit of an adjustment. Yeah, it was, it was, but I mean, I was, I was okay with that. And then I also, during that period, I got pregnant like right away with my first son. And that was, you know, that was like a strange time as well. So how did it go? Like what, what did you draw from, Merrill Lynch in that first year, how did it go? What what surprised you about it? I mean, I definitely learned a lot. They had, you know, they had kind of like a weekly meeting and, you know, we had to pass the the tests. It was sort of like if you didn't pass your Series 7, you were fired, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, well, I, it's, it's hard to do the business if you can't get the legal license required to do the business. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I didn't tell anyone I was, this was like something that probably wouldn't have happened in another job. I didn't tell anyone I was pregnant until like I'd passed my exams and, you know, was like six months pregnant. <laughs> it was like, oh, by the way, like, you know, I've been kind of hiding in the corner, but actually like I'm going to be going on maternity leave. Well, there's a challenge for, for us in the, in the business world when, you know, there are, there are team members that may be pregnant, like you're. You re you really not allowed to ask both from a legal perspective and just from a sociability perspective. It's kind of scary. Yeah, no, but you know what though? They had no idea. If I had been working in an office with like women, they would have all known. But <laughs> but but you know, I was like working with these young dudes, and you know, like wore like a jacket, and I really didn't like gain much. Like they had no idea. Like. She always drinks water whenever we go out for happy. She's just, <laughs> I guess she's just chill that way. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I learned a lot while I was there, but then my son was born in April, 2008. And, and I, and I brought on some, you know, I brought on a few clients and I did a few things, but it was, it was definitely like a challenge because once I went into, you know, quote unquote production, I was already like seven months pregnant. So it's not. And, and the market's crashing. So it's not exactly like an easy time to, to get new clients. So my son was born in April. And then I was out like a lot of the summer of 2008. And then coming out, you know, coming back in like late summer, early fall was like really, you know, that's when like in 2008, that's when a lot of stuff started happening, like with Lehman Brothers and, you know, and it was definitely like a stressful time in the office. and you know, I had a few clients, not a lot, but anyway, so they started having like layoffs and, you know, I definitely saw what I didn't want. <laughs> and, and then in, t in December of 2008, I got laid off with like a lot of other people, right? you know, after Bank of America bought Merrill Lynch. So basically everybody who was below a certain line got let go. But to me, like I look on that as a blessing because you know, by that point I realized like, okay, this is actually, I've learned a lot here, but this is not the environment I want to be in. It's kind of a, like a sales environment. It's not like the, the sort of independent ideas I had about joining this industry in the first place were not really like a reality there. So anyway, so I left in, in December, 2008, along with everybody else in the training program, pretty much. 
so as you were going through that, like where did where did clients come from early on? Like what what were you what were you finding was working for you initially? Early on, I did a couple like events about college planning. I sent out an email to like everybody I knew in LinkedIn. You know, I had a few family and like friends of family. Yeah, that's that's about it. And, and they they partnered us with a they partnered us with a advisor, experienced advisor, and that guy like kind of passed me a client that he didn't want. Anyway, that was yeah. So very much just a world of you know, I guess I, I I still view this as traditional way that we a lot of us end out getting started, particularly if you come through large term environments, like it essentially is who who do you know, right? The the friends and family, the natural network, career changer helps a little more because you you have acquaintances on LinkedIn, <laughs> like people mm-hmm. you people you worked with and knew in your prior industry where you can go and say, Hey, I'm doing a new thing now. So if you ever need help with your financial situation, I'd love to right. sit down and have coffee. Right. So like at least there's some people to send that message to, which there's not if you're coming in straight out of school. Yeah. I mean, I was like 35 and I had an MBA and, you know, I, I had worked in different fields. Like I definitely knew people who were qualified to be clients. So Merrill did its downsizing and you now suddenly find yourself in, in between opportunities. So how are you thinking about come tackling the business one comes next? You'd said earlier, you, you, you realized where you were was not where you wanted to be because it was more sales centric and wasn't giving you the independence that you, you had envisioned. So where did you go next? Yeah. I, you know, I also just want to acknowledge, like, I didn't, I, I didn't take it personally because it was, it was, it was crazy times, but it kind of reminds me of now, like right now, a lot of people are losing their jobs. You know, I've had several clients like this week, you know, tell me that they lost their job. And so, you know, in, in times like that, you don't really take it personally, but it's still kind of emotional, you know, to, to lose your job. And so I just, you know, I think we need to acknowledge that for our clients. But because I didn't take it personally, I think I was able to, you know, kind of like this happened on like a Friday, you know, by the end of the, by Monday morning, I was like calling people. So the key distinction, I guess, is because you didn't take it personally, like this wasn't, you know, Sarah, we're letting you go because we're not happy with your results. This was Sarah, we've let go in literally the entire trading class that you were in, except that one person who somehow got a bajillion dollars and is staying. Whose uncle <laughs> put, brought him into his team. <laughs> yeah. So I guess at a, at a personal level, like this, this wasn't a confidence hit personally. Yeah, not really. It was just like, okay, guess I'm not going to be doing it there. So time to find another firm. Yeah, yeah. I felt though that I was able to see like what success looked like when I was there. I mean, there were definitely people that I met during my time there that really like enjoyed their jobs and, you know, like made a nice living and that I was interested in, you know, figuring out how I could do that too. So, you know, it was good to have like that, that model or like a little bit of like a vision of like, okay, well, if I can figure out how to make this work, it could be really cool. So it was in December, 2008. And then, you know, I, I, I called some people that I had known. I knew someone who, someone who, who was at Merrill Lynch who had left and gone to UBS, you know, somebody else. Anyway, I got interviews right away because I had my licenses. I had my MBA. So even though it was like kind of like the bottom of the market and like a lot of places weren't hiring, I did get some like interviews and things right away. And I got an offer. I got two offers. So one offer was at like a more insurance type of firm. And they had like a training program. And then maybe like there was like a draw salary. And then the other thing that I ended up doing was joining the Raymond James branch and their independent contractor channel where I had no salary, no draw, but also no like sales targets. And so for me, that was what I wanted, where I would have a higher payout, no sales targets, but I could basically do things at my own pace 
without like the fear of like, you know, getting fired in six months if I wasn't making it. Interesting. So that was, that was one of the, I guess the, the, the takeaways, the feelings for you coming out from, from Merrill was like, look, I felt like I was on track. I could have, I was going to get there if only I'd gotten more time and more runway. So I just want to be at a firm where I get my own runway to do this at my own pace and don't need to worry that I'm going to lose my opportunity if I don't do it fast enough to meet their guidelines. Right. Right. And I knew I wanted to get the CFP at that point. That might might be when around when I started reading your blog, Michael. <laughs> Excellent. We are supporters of Invest in Yourself and, and get more <laughs> professional education and designations. So I've done a few of those myself over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, and I had a young child, you know, I just, you know, I wanted to, I wanted flexibility and I wanted to be able to do things at my own pace. That was the most important thing to me. So I joined a Raymond James branch in January, February of 2009. And I had, you know, I had no salary, you know, I brought over some assets, but I actually was kind of like losing money in the beginning because I paid them rent and I paid them, you know, like a, uh, override to the branch. Okay. And that branch, by the way, was also not an ideal place for me to be <laughs> because it was right on Wall Street. It was in this old, they moved later, but it was in this like terrible 80s type office. Everyone in the office was like decades older <laughs> than I was. They actually, around the time they brought me in, they brought in some other people too. But the people who had been with the branch for a long time. I mean, they were really like stock traders, no in-person meetings, all like phone calls and just, you know, not exactly the way I wanted to do business. So in, in sort of the truest sense, like this was an office of Wall Street stockbrokers. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Still living with the 1980s office furniture, apparently. <laughs> yeah, it had this like teal carpet, like covered with coffee stains. It was it was it was terrible. Nice. <laughs> nice. So, so help me understand from the the overall household context how this works. So, you know the, I mean, the challenge for a lot of people coming into the business is just having the runway to be able to say and financially make it work of. I don't want to have sales targets. I'm confident I can do this, but I want to do it at my own pace, even if that means I, I I grow slowly and steadily. So how did you make this work from a household just to be able to do that and get it off the ground? I mean, you know, you and Alan, you know, have, have talked before about the importance of having a supportive spouse. So, you know, I was lucky that I had a supportive spouse but, you know, it was definitely like a shock for us. I mean, because we went from, you know, before I got into the money business, I made a lot more money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, they say there's, there's a lot of money in the money business, but yeah. not right, not right away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the, in, the long, in the long run. Exactly. So, so, you know, there was a period when I was in marketing and, you know, we had two good salaries, but then, you know, mine kind of like fell off a cliff. But you know, my husband definitely like under had has an understanding of the business and knew that okay, well, if we figure out how to make this work, it could be really great for us financially, and we just figured it out. So this was essentially like we're we're going to live on your salary for a while while I do this advisory firm thing. We can make that work. So let's let's try it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was uh, that was a big part of. It. I mean, I had before we got into this, we had some savings. I also sold my apartment in New York City at a profit. So, I mean, you know, we were we were lucky to be able to make it work. Yeah, but it definitely financially it's not easy to to make it work. So you actually made like housing apartment changes just to try to bring costs down? Well, I mean, just by luck, I was already I had an apartment in Manhattan when I was when I was single. And then Okay. When we like got married, we sold it. <laughs> you know, oh, okay, so. just going from two to one is the oh, as the right. couple's unit. Okay, right, right. So some of that profit definitely, you know, helped like support this endeavor. But I mean, really, I thought I will say that it definitely took a lot longer to 
make money at this than I thought it would. (laughs) I mean, I had been successful in my previous career and, you know, I just, I did was, you know, had met people like at Merrill Lynch or wherever who had been successful within a couple of years of being in the business. And so just kind of assumed that I would be too, but it really, it, it took a lot of time. It took years. And so, you know, there were reasons for that, the financial crisis, me, you know, having a baby, then, you know, I later had twins, you know, there were definitely reasons that slowed things down. <laughs> that, that just takes it up a whole other, a whole other level. <laughs> we, we have three as well, but we, we did them sequentially, <laughs> not, not doubling up at once, which I'm sure is a whole other level of, of stress and exhaustion. Yeah. Yeah. So there are reasons why it took longer, but definitely took longer than I expected it too. So looking back on like, okay, getting into this industry. And also, you know, when I got laid off from Merrill Lynch, like there was like a minute where I was like, oh, well, should I take some time off like and be a stay at home mom? I mean, that didn't really feel like me. And also I didn't want my licenses and things to expire because I put work into, into getting those. But I mean, there was definitely like a minute where I was like, well, maybe I should go back to like working in the corporate world and get another marketing job, which in 2009, there weren't really a lot of those either. <laughs> so, Well, so I, I guess I may as well stay here because marketing is not <laughs> at this point. Yeah. So how long did it take for the advisory business to turn profitable, or I guess you know, co- comfortably profitable for you? I mean, probably three years, which is kind of what they say for like any sales territory or sales job is it takes like three years to, to really make a business. Is that, is that basically to like to roughly get back to where you were before? Yeah. Wasn't even, wasn't even there yet. Just wasn't even there yet, but to get like a, like a six figure income. So what were you doing at that point as you're going through this, this first three years? So the, right, I guess first three years after you've transitioned into in a Raymond James. So you, you, you've got, You've got lots of flexibility. You can do it at your own pace. So no one's hitting you with sales targets and cold calling quotas, but obviously just feeling the pressure of, I want to get my income back. I want to get growing. You know, there's now a mouth to feed at home. So what did you do? How did you come at this in trying to build a a business for the long run? Yeah. I mean, I liked, there were things about, about, you know, the independent model that I liked, you know, not having sales targets. You know, I, I liked being fee based, you know, I couldn't call myself fee only then, but being fee, you know, doing things based on fees instead of commissions. That was something that I saw as a differentiator for myself at the time. I was working hard on getting the CFP. I got the CFP in 2010 and I did the CDFA at that point too. And, and the CDFA was... So CDFA, for those who aren't familiar... Certified Divorce Financial Analyst. Okay. Yeah. And so I had had people reach out to me asking, I had had, I did B&I. Business, business networkers. International, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So I did a B&I group and, you know, I got referrals from that. Looking back later, those, I definitely got clients from that. They weren't my best clients, but definitely they did get clients from that. But an accountant I knew in that group asked if I you know, could help someone with their divorce. And I started researching that and got the CDFA designation. And that became like a bigger part of my marketing. I did the training to become a divorce mediator. There's the collaborative divorce training and, you know, group in New York City. Basically, I know a lot of like divorce mediators and attorneys (laughs) from, from that time. And so that was a good differentiator for me and a good like source of referrals and also, also just of revenue. I mean, you know, having come out of the financial crisis, like starting, you know, being a financial advisor and seeing people's AUM drop and like they're, you know, having fee-based revenue, their income was, you know, tied to like the ups and downs of the stock market you know, I really wanted to kind of diversify my revenue. And so being able to charge people like a fee for, you know, my time and my advice was something that definitely appealed to me as a way to diversify my revenue. So what were you doing from a business model? Because you were, 
you were doing that coming out of the market decline, the AUM decline from the financial crisis. Obviously, this has now become a highly salient topic again lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going through another bear market cycle and the there's a lot of virtues for the AUM model and the growth that you get during bull markets, but then you have to deal with the bear market that goes the other way. Mm-hmm. So what was the what was the revenue model that you were starting to build on? Yeah, I mean, I've I've increased it over time. So I think when I started doing divorce financial planning, I was charging, I want to say like one fifty an hour, and I was totally underestimating the number of hours it would take me to do something as well. But I mean, I was you know reviewing things for like five hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, you know, something like that. Now I try, I have my rate is three hundred an hour, but I estimate. I do like a flat fee and upfront for divorce related projects. I charge $300 an hour and I estimate this project is going to take five hours. Therefore I'm charging you $1,500 for this scope of work. Yeah, but it's like a 10 hour minimum. So, okay. Yeah. So it's like 3000, but then if it's a more complicated case, well then it might be like 4,500 or or, or more. And then if we, you know, work on this for a while, we finish our deliverables, but then you come back to me later for just like a few, a few things. Well, then it's just an hourly charge, 300. So for those who aren't familiar with sort of the divorce planning niche unto itself, like what are you, what are you doing for $150 an hour, now $300 an hour with these, you know, 10 hour project minimums and up? Like what, what do you, what do you do? Yeah. I mean, I would say that the the people I like working with and the people I attract are the ones who are like somewhat amicable. (laughs) And a lot of them have kids. A lot of them are doing the mediation process, but they still need to kind of like get organized. They need a budget. Like they're mediator or attorney is asking them, oh, well, what's your net worth? What, you know, what is your budget? Like they don't know. And so helping them get organized and like looking back at their last, at their spending history to see what it costs to run their life. And, you know, putting all these documents, I use a software called family law software, which the, a lot of the attorneys also use. So putting like their, their net worth and their budget into a format that everybody can work with. And then starting to look at different ways of dividing their assets there's usually more than one way to divide it. There can be tax implications. What if they sell their apartment or their home? You know, there could be like capital gains implications to that. You know, look at looking at all those aspects before so that people can make informed decisions. Because really, once you have a settlement agreement, you're not really going back. Okay. The software also calculates like child support, spouse support as well. So, you know, helping people be realistic about what they can expect in that area as well. And so that's why this ends up being hourly project style work. It's just going through with an individual or the couple and just helping them get oriented. Like, okay, if you never brought all your stuff together in one place, here is your net worth. Yeah. Here is your ca- household cash flow. Here is the actual dollars that you live on. Like I was going to say the budget you live on, because they if they didn't budget, it's not a budget, but just like, here's a, here's a reflection of where your money goes. Well, yeah. So it's like, okay, well, here's what it costs to run your life in the past. But now if you go from one household to two, you know, what, what can we project for that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is like a project type of work. It's really helpful. And it's also like objective third-party verification. So say one person has been like handling all the finances well, trust is pretty low at this moment in time in the relationship. And so you don't want to just like accept everything <laughs> that this person like gives the lawyer. You want someone to like review it against the tax return, against the statements, make sure that things are accurate. And also, I mean, frankly, we'll notice things about a tax return that most people are not going to notice. You know, I had a client who was filing our taxes jointly. And I said, oh, well, you know, you're not retired. Why did you take out $200,000 from your retirement accounts last year? And she, you know, had no idea. <laughs> and that was, like, you know. We did what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, oh, he's been taking all these withdrawals and I had no idea. So things like that. 
So how did you view this overall from the business end? Was the idea these hourly and project fees can balance out my AUM? Was the idea I'm going to do this because I can actually get AUM clients by doing the divorce work for them first? Like how are you how are you approaching this? It was a mix. So I wanted to have revenue that wasn't tied to assets. Also, I mean, with, you know, AUM revenue, it takes time for it to play out. Like there's a lag. So if you bring in, you know, $500,000 in a, in an IRA, well, you don't really get the 1% paid for that on day one. You know, it plays out over the course of a year. Right. Like, you know, okay. Congratulations on your five hundred thousand dollar account. In three months, you'll get like a thousand dollars, right? With right. The first quarterly billing, right? And so, you know, having like flat fees or hourly fees was a way for diversify my revenue, but also to like increase immediate revenue. And then, you know, some percentage of those clients, probably about a third, have also become like long term planning. And investment clients. And so, and those are some of my best clients, to be honest, in terms of revenue, relationship, referrals, all those things. But it's hard work. <laughs> yeah. You make an interesting point about this framing of just having hourly and project planning fees as a way to fill in revenue sort of early on when you're not yet at a critical mass of ongoing clients and, not, and ongoing recurring revenue, whether it's you know AUM fees or subscriptions or whatever you're doing. Like it, it takes time to build that and accumulate that client base. So, and to be fair, I mean, if you look at most of the large advisory firms today, like the large AUM firms today, I mean, they many of them did not build AUM from scratch from day one. Because they started 20 and 30 years ago when the world was largely commission-based. And they were earning commissions in the early years because it's front-loaded compensation. <laughs> so it makes the math work better. And then after you've got a certain base of clients, you start selecting trail options. You start mixing your revenue to be more recurring. You kind of graduate into your recurring revenue over time. And then eventually, you've got enough recurring revenue that you don't need the upfronts. If you're living in a in a fee-only world today or, or trying to build in an RIA context, you don't get upfront commissions is an option to front load your income, but you do get, you know, pay pay by the hour or pay by the project upfront planning fees. Right. As a way to just get upfront dollars going for work being done immediately while you build your recurring revenue client base over time. Right. And that I mean that was definitely also something that I saw, you know, coming out of out of my first firm was that, you know, you had these targets you had you know sales targets you had to, to make but to do that with you know AUM fees i mean it would have been very difficult <laughs> you know to do in the time frame and right. so a lot of the advisors who you know were successful in that or or at least tried to be successful you know they were looking for the things that had like a higher commission or you know like annuities you know or structured products and things. And so that was got to qualify your contract long enough to stay in the game to get the exactly, <laughs> to exactly. get the long term opportunity. Yeah. And so I didn't want to do that. Now I don't certainly don't want to do that or have that option. But anyway, there was still there's still like kind of a need to, you know, I, I keep saying it was like, to me, it was a made me feel comfortable to diversify my revenue. So how did that grow and evolve over time? Like, did the divorce world become a growing part of your practice as you got traction there? Or did you bid? Did you do less of it? Because once you build enough ongoing clients, it's like I don't really need to do this project work anymore. I'm going to do less of it. Like how did it? How did it evolve? Mm, it's gone up and down. I mean, I started doing some. I did some presentations for like a, me, a group of mediators that I was part of, and then I was later I was on their board for the like family and divorce mediation council of New York. So I got to know a lot of people that way. You know, I will say I definitely have, I understand attorneys a lot more than I, than I used to. So, you know, so that grew over time. I mean, there have been, there have been times that I've not really wanted to take on any additional divorce clients because it can be stressful work. 
And I still, I mean, there are people that say like, oh, you know, this is a successful niche for you. You should do a hundred percent, you know, divorce work. But I just, I just don't want to do that because it, it can be some of like my most draining client work is working on some of these divorce cases. Interesting. So yeah. from the, I guess the, the mental or psychological diversification perspective, you actually didn't want to go all into the divorce niche. I didn't. Yeah, I'm I'm happily married, so I don't you know I don't want to like spend you know my nights like stressing about other people's divorces. I I get it. Like makes sense to me. I I'll admit even on my end, like there's there's project work that I've done over the over the years. You know, both li- little bits around divorce, although I didn't go deeply into that expertise. And and for you know some of my early career, I did a lot of writing and publishing around annuities. And ended up doing a stint for a couple of years where I was doing a lot of expert witness work on on annuity cases, you know, inappropriate annuity sales to to clients, either you know, h- helping clients make the case against the agent, or every now and then actually, you know, supporting on agents who were getting unfairly accused of, you know, all annuities are bad when actually they made an absolutely fine recommendation. There was nothing wrong with it. But I I ultimately stopped doing all that work. So like I just just found being immersed in the middle of the litigation process to not be very psychologically gratifying. Like it was, it was remunerative, like expert work like that pays very well, but it's just, it's stressful. And I was bringing home the stress and, and decided like, I'm, I'd rather find a niche where I feel more helper than find a niche where I'm, you know, trying to figure out how to defeat the other attorney. Yeah. Who's, you know, trying to do every legal trick available to win the case for their client because that's what a lawyer does to defend their clients. Like didn't didn't feel didn't feel good, at least to me. It wasn't a game I liked playing. Yeah. I mean, I haven't pursued like the really the highly litigated cases. I mean, for that reason. Because I mean, I have seen things get like really kind of ugly and I just I just don't really want to be involved. So so talk to us about how the business has evolved then over the over the years. So you you kind of set your you know planned your flag at Raymond James. I'm going to do this on my own pace. You got your CFP and your CDFA early so that you could start doing some of this divorce work. It blended the it diversified the revenue. It brought a little bit more upfront dollars in a world where AUM sometimes builds a little more slowly. So how did that? kind of marketing and growth process for you change or evolve as as the years went by. Yeah, I would say my other my other sort of key client niche would be couples kind of that I had something in common with. <laughs> so, you know, I was living in kind of, you know, what they call brownstone Brooklyn and there's a lot of like families with young kids living in that area. They maybe have like two income, high income, but also high expenses. And there's like more responsibility, you know, when you have young kids. So, and I would say a lot of creative professionals, like maybe one person has a more corporate job with benefits and health insurance and maybe stock options and things like that. And the other person is maybe like an independent contractor, freelancer type of uh type of person kind of like being in a role where you are an advisor and is an independent contractor in a creative role with a spouse <laughs> who is in a more corporate job with health exactly. insurance and like sounds vaguely familiar exactly yeah and wh- what a what a mystery why do i attract these people <laughs> so so when you look at my like average aum client base it all it kind of like works out to age the average and is like 45 and the median is probably like a little younger than that. So, you know, people, you know, they have good jobs, you know, they, maybe a lot of their assets are in their 401k, but then if they change jobs at some point, well then maybe we manage that too. So, I mean, a lot, not all my clients are divorced. So that, that's been like a niche for me, but it's not even the majority of our clients. And so, how do you think about this now from the marketing perspective? Right? You've kind of got, because it sounds like there's almost three buckets of clients. There's people that you get on the divorce end. You know, it works. They even turn on clients, but can't do that all the time because they're stressful. You've got sort of this dual high income with kids and complex lives 
subset of clients or I, I feel like quintessential Gen X because this, this is our life right now. Yes. <laughs> right. And, and sort of serving your your peer network and the people that you you interact with directly. And then it sounds like you've also just got others that showed up in the practice because if you're out there doing this long enough, at some point people refer people and you just send out with some other clients as well. Yeah. I did some acquisitions when I was at Raymond James also. So what did that look like? There was one that was really nice. It was like another advisor in my branch. He wasn't like physically located in the branch, so I didn't know him that well, but he was like affiliated with the the OSJ. Anyway, so he wanted to kind of reduce his client base and kind of, you know, offload his kind of like C clients. And I, I took those over and that actually worked out really well. And so there was like a, a shared payout for some period of time and then it was over and they were my clients and I still have a few of them. And this was you know years ago. So I'm curious just how that, how that worked a little bit more from the economics ends. Cause I, I, to me, this has always been a prime opportunity for advisors in the early years. Just this, this whole phenomenon that like basically wherever you are up and down the wealth management spectrum, like there's always a phenomenon where your C clients are someone else's A clients. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like when you're getting started, pretty much anyone who fogs a mirror and can pay you is an A client for you, but it might be a C client for somewhere else. And at some point, I mean, I, I know large firms where, you know, their minimums are $10 million. Like they're horrible C client, their accommodation client that only has $4 million mm-hmm. is someone else's amazing A client. Like it exists up and down the spectrum. There's always a phenomenon where someone else's C client is your A client and your A client is someone else's C client. But often we kind of hold on to everything. We don't necessarily let these go. So how did how did you figure out a structure or some economics that actually made this comfortable to transition where you got a chance at these clients. Yeah. I mean, this was years ago too. So and I, I want to say it was maybe, it wasn't like a huge acquisition. It was like 20 clients and it was like over three, I shared revenue with him for over three years. Just like a 50-50 split kind of thing? It was like reducing. So I think it was like 60-40, 70-30, 80-20, so I think. Okay. So like, so he got, he got 40, then 30, then 20. Right. Right. And the idea I'm assuming was he got that split, not only on whatever the trails or ongoing revenue was, but anything new that you did as well. That was part of the opportunity for With that client for him is like, you want to go out and call on them and find new opportunities. Like, okay, you can buy them out. But if you make new opportunities, like I still get a revenue share on those. That's part of how we both benefit because otherwise you may as well just keep the trails forever. Yeah. Yeah. But that, so that was fine. And so they were, they all, I don't know if they started that way or it's, it's like hard to remember it was so long ago, but they were all became, you know, fee only clients. And, and I don't have all of them now because I've made changes along the way, but you know, I still have a few of them that are, they're very dear. They're nice people. But then I did a second thing like that, that was kind of a disaster. So what, how was this one different and what changed from the first? So someone, he, he wanted to have a, he was an older gentleman who, you know, was kind of being pressured to have a succession agreement in place and, but didn't want to retire, you know, asked me if I was interested. And I said, well, you know, not really because Actually, I'm like pregnant with twins and (laughs) I, you know, don't really, you know, this isn't like good timing for me. And he's like, well, that's perfect because I don't want to retire anyway, but I need someone to be on, you know, I need someone to be like on this agreement so that if I get hit by a bus, you know, that I'm covered. So I said, okay. So I didn't. You know, so I was, I forget what they call it, but I was kind of like the backup, you know, person just in case. But I mean, he really wasn't planning on retiring for a few years and I wasn't planning on taking over this business. Well, I mean, of course, you know, like what happens is he was kind of like forced into retirement. Like, like I'm trying to think my, my uh, twins were born in November of 2014 and I got the call on like 
November 15th saying, oh, well, you know, this guy needs to retire December 1st. Can you take over? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Like two two weeks after the twins are born, and you have two weeks to do. The yeah, and there was like RMDs to do, and it was it was like such a mess. But I mean, I we you know I handled it, but I was like really not happy about it, and and I hadn't really done you know a lot of due diligence because I really mm-hmm. wasn't planning on taking over. But they were just not good clients for me. They you know they had annuities and they had the things that were fee had like higher, you know, way higher fees than I would have done. And, you know, he was getting a revenue share, but it like dropped immediately and he wasn't happy about that. And and I just, you know, it was unpleasant. And so in retrospect, like, wish you hadn't done it, wish you just done it under different terms. Like what, what would you have done differently if you could go back and remake this? I would have, done more due diligence (laughs) and, you know, looked more at like the client investments to see if they were in alignment with my philosophy. Meaning like you're a passive investor. He was active day trading stocks. One of those kinds of distinctions. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, like people in like energy stocks and I don't know. And, and annuities that were, like a high, you know, there, there was like a lot of annuities. <laughs> That's not, I don't want to, I don't want to say too many details, but yeah, we were not really in alignment. I, I think we, I think we get the general gist. Okay. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so in retrospect, like, had you known you just wouldn't have done it? Like, is that the distinction here? I would, I would have said, pass, find somebody else. I wish, in fact, I went and I wish that's what I would have said because I, because I knew, and I mean, I, and I was up front. I mean, I told him, I was like, listen, I'm, I'm pregnant with twins. Like I'm not the right person. I'm, I'm not, I don't want this right now. And it was like, oh, well that's perfect because then they won't push me to retire. Right. So, so the X factor that you didn't realize is the reason that some manager was pushing him to complete this form was because the manager intended to expedite his exit. Yeah. As soon as the form was done. And so you became the recipient of that master yeah. plan that you were not privy to. Yeah. It was kind of a disaster. Yeah. So anyway, so I was at Raymond James. I was in their independent contractor division. And then I had always, I was, most of my business, like 90 plus 95% was fees. You know, I had a little bit of random trails, I guess maybe some uh, like 529s, you know, some some things that had come along the way. But most of my business was fees. I wanted to be fee only. I wanted to start an RIA. So I started my RIA in 2016. And, and when I left that branch, you know, that acquisition stayed with the branch, which was perfectly fine with me. So what, what led the shift and transition to to say you wanted to go full RIA in, in 2016? You know, I had, I had even looked into like starting my own RIA back in like 2009 and decided, okay, well, I wasn't ready for it. I didn't have enough assets. I didn't have, you know, enough, enough clients, but it's funny because I feel like it's easier now, you know, with X, Y, (laughs) like that doesn't seem to have stopped a lot of people who join X, Y planning network who, you know, start their own RIAs with no clients and no experience. Yeah. No, I, I think that the landscape has certainly shifted dramatically, like even just over the past 10 years of, well, obviously we, we, you know, we put out a platform like X, Y planning network to support people going RIA or launching their own RAs, but just the the whole ecosystem. I mean, oh, the, yeah. the breadth of technology is drastically different than what it was 10 years ago. Outsourcing providers, all the different ways that you can get help. I mean, you got, you know, more tech tools, more providers, you know, third-party services to plug in all over the place. You know, the the good and bad news, I mean, you still got to decide how you want to put all that together, right? That's the the benefit and the curse of being an independent advisor and a, and a business owner. But, you know, like I just, I mean, I've watched it over the years from back in the 2000s, sort of the, the rough rule of thumb was you didn't even think about going independent RAA until you had more than a hundred million under management. Yeah. That's basically what it took to, 
to cover the hard costs of the staff you would have to hire to do various things. And then by the early 2010s, it was probably 50 million before the economics really worked. And then by the mid teens, it was like 25 million. And now these days, like, I see firms where the crossover is probably something on the order of of 10 million. And if you're growth minded enough, and you think you'll get there quickly enough, like, you, you just launch and do it from zero, because you're gonna hit the crossover relatively quickly, if you think you're gonna go that route, or not even an AUM basis, but just like, what it costs in hard dollar costs to get the basic tech and stuff that you need, like, a hundred plus thousand dollars of revenue, and you already start seeing the crossover that if you're going to run a relatively lean RIA, you can start getting better economics from the RIA side than the independent broker dealer side, at, at least if you want all of the rest of the responsibility and work that goes with running your own business. Some people yeah. want that. So you you continue using platforms. Which I like that part, you know. So and I think that that's like what I what I always wanted. And so, you know, I started seeing you know, more stories and, you know, reading about, you know, people who were doing, doing the RIA business and, you know, seeing those models and realizing, well, I could do this, I could do this too. And so I, you know, prepared for that and I launched my RIA in 2016. So what drove you to make the change at the end of the day? Like what, what were you going, going from or trying to get to that made you want to go through that? You know, there's the economics, but there's also, you know, kind of what I said before about like realizing like I'm in an environment that does not align with my philosophy or or brand. So, I mean, at a certain point I was, you know, part of this branch that, you know, I have nothing in common with these people. Because you're trying to be a fee-oriented financial planner in a in a in a branch of 1980s style stockbrokers, right, <laughs> right. And so and and so I'm paying, you know, I'm paying them, but like, what are they? What am I really getting for what I'm paying? You know, someone to deny my tweets, <laughs> you know. So yeah. I don't know. You know, it just it, it just it became frustrating because like, why am I part of this? You know, when that doesn't really seem to have anything to do with me. Anyway, so that's, but it wasn't anything against, you know, that particular broker dealer, like their technology was, was fine. And also I think having a marketing background is part of it too, because I really didn't want to like promote their marketing message and their, you know, communications and things. I always thought things connected better with clients when, when I write, write them. Okay. So it was, so it's not like it was kind of a blend of just the, I'll call it the, the direct economics, just, you know, can I, can I keep more of my dollars when I can cover mm-hmm. my own expenses than using their own overhead? Sort of the, the indirect economics of, you know, the, the broker dealer takes a slice, but I don't feel like I'm getting my value for the slice that they take because I don't use the things that they offer. Mm-hmm. And then some of the, the control around marketing and messaging of being able to say, I want to put out, you know, my communications as Sarah from Sarah written by Sarah and not need to run corporate communications. That is harder when you're in a large brokerage environment. Yeah. They, they, they were, I mean, com, you know, comparatively speaking, they were pretty you know, progressive in that area. I had, I had a blog since I think I started in 2012. So I had a blog while I was still, you know, affiliated with them. And now that blog is sort of like morphed into my website, but my old posts are probably out there. So how did that transition go? Like, what was it, what was it like trying to take that leap and make the transition? So the branch was mad at me. <laughs> they weren't, they weren't happy about it. Why were they mad? Well, cause you know, they felt that they had done things for me that, and You know, I was their like only advisor that was business was actually growing. You know, it was it's revenue for them as well. Okay, how did you break the news? Oh, I don't even remember. But I I I asked to speak with with the manager, and it was like a father and son team. I don't I don't really want to say anything negative about them because they tried, but (laughs) obviously. It didn't work out. You're 
you're not there now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not there now. I mean, I, I gave them lots of warning. I, you know, I told them like three, I was like, well, this is what I'm going to do next quarter. I, and I talked to, so I kept my assets within Raymond James. So they have, they had a division for like RIAs and I moved to that division. And so I approached them and it said, this is something I wanted to do. And they said, Oh, well, you're below our asset minimum to do that. Why don't you, you know, call us back in a year? And I said, well, you know, as though you're going to move all of your assets off the platform, but then when you grow, yeah, you'll call them back to bring it back. <laughs> well, no, no, no. They wanted me to stay, you know, in my existing branch. And oh, okay. I said, okay. yeah, I, I was like, well, if I don't do this with you, I'm going to, you know, go someplace else. Anyway, so I, so I moved assets with them. I was below their, their minimum, but I moved my assets to that division. And so, but I had to repaper all my clients, which was a lot of work. But they still kept the same account number and the same website, so that was good. But they had to sign paperwork because because you were flipping the advisory agreement. I'm assuming because you were going yeah. from you know, Ray, Ray J Paper advisory agreement to Sarah Standage's RIA advisory agreement. Right, right. And I moved to office space. Why using Ray J's? RA platform as opposed to the other choices that are out there. Well, then then I moved again. <laughs> so two oh, okay. years later. Yeah. So I did that in 2016. And then two years later, I ended up moving everything to TD Ameritrade. So I guess I'm curious about both then. Like what, what led you to stay? And then what led you to go two years later? I mean, I think staying, you know, I, I stayed because I wasn't, you know, particularly unsatisfied with them you know, in terms of like the technology and such. So I, and I thought it would be an easier transition for my clients. Like I thought that that was like reassuring, like, oh, your account number doesn't change. Your money is not moving. You know, you just need to like sign this paperwork because, you know, like you said, the advice, the advisory agreement is changing. So that was the reason, really the reason I did it was to make an easier transition for my clients. But then I started kind of looking at the, technology. I wanted more technology options. And TD was kind of like integrated with everybody. So the T- TD Ameritrade's sort of VO open access platform was the driver just because of all the all the integrations that are there? Yeah. Yeah. So I tested them with like a few accounts, like a few new accounts. So there was a period where I had two custodians. And then, you know, I looked at the economics of it and it was it's like a lot of, it, it was saving me money. Like every, you know, the, the TD was more profitable. What was saving you money? The, it was like the account types at, at Raymond James had like certain, you know, like underlying fees with the, the payouts that would come to me. I can't even remember the details. I mean, like moving to the RIA was some, was, you know, an increase in profitability over being like the branch. That's for sure. Right. But then, move into TD, like also, and there was also like a technology fee. There was, you know, there were some fees, but it wasn't really, I mean, there, there were some fees, but I would say the, it was really more about like the freedom and to, to sort of set up my own technology. So it was mostly just the, the broader range of technology integrations and, and ways you could put together your stack. Yeah. But not everybody needs that. You know, in fact, a lot of sure. people would rather not have to make all those choices. So, so what changed in terms of the the firm's marketing or messaging? Because I I'm struggling. This is sort of the first point in the journey when you are actually entirely under your own umbrella. I'm free. There's, there's no more corporate <laughs> oversight of what you can say, not say. Were you still actually pretty happy with where it was and did the same thing? Did it did it start to completely change? Like what, what happened at that point from the marketing perspective? I mean, not that much really changed, to be honest. However, I think that the industry changed and I think that people are looking for fee only in a way that they weren't like five plus years ago. Well, I think ever, ever since Department of Labor fiduciary rule hit and, and sort of put put fiduciary and advisor compensation into mainstream media. Yeah. 
there's there's more discussion around around it than there was before. Yeah, and our clients are, edu- you know, highly educated. I mean, the, like a lot of people ask, like, "Are you a fiduciary?" You know, and so they didn't ask that. Like when I got into this business, you know, nine years ago. So so that is is uh, and and so of course we get clients now from things from NAPFA and XYPN. You know, we're we're po- we're listed on some places for fee only advisors now. So I guess we get a few clients from those. But yeah, I think that that fee only and fiduciary is didn't used to be like maybe it's less of a differentiator now. I know you've made that point on your blog, but I don't think anybody was even really looking for it, you know, five plus years ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the double edged sword. Like for first people start looking for it. And if you do that, you're different. And then a lot of people look for it and everybody does it. And then it's not different anymore. The markets, markets are wonderfully adaptive, but it takes some time to get there. It means when you're in the, when you're in the right place, when that's what people are looking for, it becomes a very nice growth opportunity for you. And we've changed our sales process also. I have a more defined sales process now where I do like a short intro meeting where I used to do a free consult that was like an hour plus and, you know, wasted a lot of time, frankly. Now I do a short intro call and then I do a, a consult meeting that people have to prepare for by providing data and statements and things. So just walk me through what this looks like now from the marketing perspective when someone's interested because i i i mean i noticed sort of on your site like you've got i guess interesting stuff i don't see on a lot of other advisory firms there's like a a calendly link i can write on your page can set up like either an introduction call or a discovery session or a or a consultation meeting your, your home page has this cool like assessment are you cultivating wealth because your because your firm is cultivating wealth that takes you to a quiz with a bunch of stuff you learn about yourself so so talk to us about what that that marketing and sales process looks like for you at this point. Yeah, so people find us, you know, maybe they're referred by a client, maybe, you know, I we write blog posts that get out there, you know, occasionally and connect with people and they're prompt they can schedule an intro call. There's that quiz, that quiz is is powered by data points. I'm sure you know. Okay. Yep. So what is what is the assessment do just for people who aren't familiar with with data points? Like what is it? What is it measuring? It's about the wealth building factors. Yeah, they have all this research and studies show like what factors are correlated with people who are building wealth. So it's it's like the short version of one of their assessments. It's like for lead gen. So the idea is like people People who do this and score well are more likely to be wealth builders, which is otherwise known as probably a good prospect because <laughs> they, they exhibit wealth building behaviors. Yeah. I mean, the short version of that quiz is pretty short. So, you know, it's just kind of, it's it's just a way to like kind of engage and, and you know, get people's email addresses, you know, frankly. Okay. So they get a little bit of information about it. Maybe it's intriguing, but then they're also added to our email list and to get our, get our newsletter. And the intro call is you schedule a 15 minute call with me, Nanette or Liz. It's just, you know, you don't need to prepare for it. You know, there's not really much commitment you know, for a 15 minute call, but the 15 minute call, we talk, you know, find out from the client what they're looking for, why they reached out to a financial planner, and then just give them a you know very high level of, you know, what we do and also how much it costs. So, you know, really the, like to me that the purpose of that call, that call is to like kind of qualify people and also, yeah, qualify that they are still interested after they find out that this is something that costs, you know, thousands of dollars. And you find 15 minutes is enough to, to get through that conversation. I mean, it's enough to, I mean, we let it, if it's, you know, we're having an interesting conversation, you know, we'll let it go on, but it's enough to eliminate people who are not a good fit. (laughs) Right. So uh, (laughs) <laughs> the goal is not to get to know everything about the client to get them fired up to work together and and start your data gathering. The point is just to screen out the 
yeah, this clearly is not going to be a fit. Yeah. And actually even before, so when they sign up for the intro call, they actually 24 hours before that, they get a, you know, reminder confirmation, but then also an email of frequently asked questions. And so that is a good, really good screener. So thanks for scheduling the call. You know, 15 minutes isn't a lot of time. So here are some frequently asked questions to get these out of the way so we can spend our time talking about you. And the frequently asked questions, I'm just going from memory here, but it is, are you a fiduciary? Why, yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> you know, how do you get paid? Well, you know, we can, there's really two ways we can do a flat, you know, flat fee or a, a project-based fee. The, a lot of those are related to divorce. Or we can manage your investments. And that's the fee on that is typically 1% of his investments under management. And like our flat fees are $4,500 for individuals and $6,000 for couples. And so sometimes people get that email and they're like, oh, actually, this is not something I'm interested in. Right. Fine. Oh, also, one of the frequently asked questions is, can I hire you for just an hour or two? And, I, and it says, you know, sorry, we're, you know, we can't do that right now. We're actually just too busy. And, and out of curiosity, like, why cover that stuff in the email confirm as opposed to on the site itself? Or, or do you also cover it on the site, but people don't read it? So then you have to send it to them in the, in the email as well. It's like also on the site. I just want to make sure they get the point. Yeah. Okay. So it's so you 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 put it out there in both, but it sounds like have actively found, despite the fact this is on my website, not everybody reads everything on the website. So I'm also going to put it here and it saves me some calls. Yeah. And so if that call goes well, what comes next? The consultation meeting. And so that meeting, we asked people to prepare for that meeting. And actually, it was a pretty good process. When you schedule that meeting, it goes to a questionnaire, which asks you you know, a few questions and goes to a job form, form and also generates a Dropbox folder, a shared Dropbox folder where people can upload documents. So it asks you a few questions like, oh, do you own or rent? And so if you, if you own it, generates like a list of documents you should provide. And so it's like tax return, pay stub. But if you own, it's mortgage statement. Like what tool or technology are you using just to guide that, like to give questions and contextual answers? Oh, since since you said you own and not rent, please put your, you know, your mortgage in there and not your rental agreement. Yeah, I, I actually hired Ariel Minicosi to set that up for us. Okay. And, and Ariel is an industry consultant? Yes. She's a, I'm sorry, Ariel, but I can't remember the name of your firm right now. Well, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll get in touch with Ariel and find out. So if, if folks are interested, this is episode 177. So we'll have, if you go to kids.com slash 177, we will have links out for Ariel if you want similar automation efficiencies for yourself. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, something just, you know, coming at this with kind of like a marketing background is I started last year, like actually tracking this stuff, like, okay, how many introductions calls, how many consultations, how many discovery meetings. So people have the consultation meeting in the consultation meeting. We have a PowerPoint presentation, which is a little bit more about our firm, how we work with our clients, but then there's a few slides that are customized to the client. So here's what we saw you know, when we looked at your stuff, you know, here are the things we think we would f start focusing on for you. And, you know, my idea with that, and then I also have some case studies of, you know, clients that so have something in common, you know, with this prospect, you know, the idea is to like, leave them wanting more, like give them some useful information, but leave them wanting more. And then if they, after that meeting, we send a proposal I started using a software called Panda Docs for that, and I really like it. If they say yes to the proposal, we send them the advisory agreement and schedule what we call a discovery meeting. So what, what does Panda Docs do exactly in this process? You know, it's something I just, I'm just trying to remember who I saw using it, but you can have a, like a template proposal or template documents. Okay. 
you know, like advisory agreement or investor profile. And so, you know, you have a template, you put in the new, you know, name, the advisor name, the client name, their, you know, their email address, you know, populates the document, sends it to them and does like an electronic signature back to you. And there's also like a billing feature to it. So if there's like a a first payment that, that they're doing, then they can pay right from there as well. It integrates with QuickBooks. It's pretty awesome. Interesting. Okay. And so, so you come out of your consultation meeting, I've got a feel for what their concerns are. You send them a proposal of here's what we do. And what, it, what is a proposal look like for you? Is this like, here are some recommendations we might work on? Is it just like, uh, here are portfolio changes we would make? The proposal is like, okay, here's what we heard from you. The portfolio is really not that specific. Maybe it might have some things about asset allocation if they're like, if they're way off. It's not really focused on the investments. So it, a lot of times what we're talking about more is like consolidate, streamline your investments. Okay. You know, so so my clients like this sort of Gen X, they've changed jobs many times. You know, they've opened up accounts all over the place. There's no like global view of like how everything works together. So the consolidate and it's the consolidate and streamline is actually I think more of a value. You know, it's more the value that I'm focusing on than like actually, you know, better objectively better investments. Right. Yeah. So the proposal is here's what we heard from you and what we would focus on. Here's like a timeline of, you know, our next meetings that we would do. And here's the price. And, and ideally like you send out the proposal and if they're ready to be on board, they sign. Do you do like a follow-up call or let's walk through the proposal? Actually, my proposal says, if you'd like to move forward, reply yes to this email. <laughs> and then I'll send, and so then they say, yes. And I say, that's great news. Let's get your discovery meeting on the calendar. And I'll send you the, the paperwork for the, like your advisor agreement, investor profile, whatever it is. And, and so they say, yes, we're off and running. If they say no, like, so sorry, wish you the best in wherever you end out. Basically, yeah. They'll say, sorry, we decided to go in another direction or, you know, we're maybe we'll talk, maybe we'll reach back out in six months. It's fine. And then talk to us a little bit more about what you're doing for getting people up to this point. You had mentioned, you know, like you're ultimately you're using data points to get, to get someone's email address. You, you publish some, some blog material that you were doing before and have continued. So what is, what does that look like in terms of trying to get email addresses? What do you do with email addresses? What are you actually sending people? Like, Yeah. So I have a newsletter I've been sending out about monthly and it's, it's like a message from me and then kind of, uh, we've been blogging and you know, what we're blogging, what we're reading. And so there's usually some, you know, recent blog posts and then some interesting articles that we're reading. Interesting what we're reading. So just, just kind of curating, like, Here's a couple articles we're reading, you know, parentheses that you presumably will be interested in as well, or or might be, just so you can add value but don't have to write it all. Yeah, and so it's like sort of financial planning slash economics, you know, slash life and times of Gen X, <laughs> who are now home for many many months <laughs> of of parents of young kids, you know. Yes. So. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm supposed to be an expert on homeschooling, but <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> yeah, we are neither. There's a, I feel like there's definitely sort of a generational Gen X, I guess, sort of front end millennials as well. Of, yeah, I I had kids and I work, but I I didn't plan to homeschool my kids while I work. That was not part of the master plan <laughs> that I'm now rolling with. Yes, yes. Given the pandemic, so. As you kind of reflect on this journey, what's surprised you the most about trying to build your own advisory business? You know, maybe I was just overconfident, but I think it surprised me how long it took. <laughs> so, so it's it's taken a long time. There's just been a lot of ups and downs, you know, along the way. It, it's a it's a really good business to be in. 
you know, I, I, I have to say, I, I feel very lucky that I love what I do. And, you know, I have the, you know, ability to, to, to do work that I enjoy. So paint a picture for us of what, what the firm actually looks like today. Like, where do you stand on I don't know, clients or AUM or revenue or however you, you size the practice? Like, where does it stand today? Yeah, I mean, we had like 50 million in revenue and... Or 50 million in, in assets under management. I mean, assets, sorry, assets. <laughs> yeah, 50 million in assets and about 85% of our revenue is like AUM fees. And so then there's kind of close... I mean, I would like it this year to be like $100,000 in like non-AUM fees, you know, type of revenue. So that's still the divorce divorce planning project work? Yeah, yeah. And that's because you want to you wanna grow it or that's just some of your counterbalance to the market downturn? Yeah, no, I mean, this, just this past quarter, it was like almost 40000 so it's actually more than a hundred thousand for the year. It was like forty thousand in planning fees, like non not AUM fees. So just planning fees. So that's divorce and well, we also do general comprehensive financial plans for people who don't want us to manage their assets. Okay. And how many how many clients across the business now? So there are ninety five households where we're managing their AUM. And then at any given time, there's probably somewhere between five and 10 planning clients. Okay. They're just at, at, at some stage of the planning process. Right. Right. And what does this look like from a team and infrastructure perspective? Like, are you, are you on your own? Do you have other support in place? Yeah. So I have two CFPs that work with me. So one joined us in 2018. So she's full time. She's a CFP. She she works with clients, but we we generally kind of do like a team based approach where we both are in most calls with clients. But like she'll lead the email follow up, the you know developing the plan, and then another planner joined someone I I knew through X Y Nanette that you know too joined in October of last year. So now there are three planners. We also have a virtual assistant. She brought some of her own clients, but we work together on clients as well. New clients come in. And then we have a, I have a virtual assistant who like handles all our TD paperwork. And is, is that a full-time employee? Is that a part-timer? Mm, she's, uh, she's definitely part-time. So, and she, she's affiliated with a firm called Total Office, and they work with other advisors, other financial advisors. A lot of them are TD you know, custody with TD. So she's familiar with the paperwork. Okay. So that's, you know, a big load off. I'm trying to think that's, that's about it. I, I had a marketing person, like, you know, part-time, very part-time, like consultant. I, well, I have a bookkeeper. That's about it. And so how has the firm evolved with your role as, as the team grows and shifts? I mean, I would like to, I would like, I'd like to grow our team. I mean, I would like cultivating wealth to be a regional RIA. I, you know, I would really like to grow dramatically and hire more planners, like more client facing, maybe a para planner to support, you know, my planners so that they can spend more time talking to clients. And I would like to actually reduce my time talking to clients so that I can spend more time on marketing and sales and, you know, operations and process and things like that. So what was the, what was the low point for you on this journey? Hmm. I mean, I guess, early, like, I haven't really thought about quitting since like, like 2009. So I guess maybe I'm, I have a lot of perseverance <laughs> So I feel like we're all getting our, our resiliency tested a little bit more in the current environment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had, 
I've gone through phases, you know, with like with the divorce clients where I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I working on this case? It's a death march. You know, <laughs> why, you know, I should not do this type of work or, or a client, you know, is, is unhappy because, you know, they're just emotional. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess the low point has just been like kind of general frustration of like not succeeding as, as quickly or as greatly as, as other people around me seem to be, (laughs) you know, comparing myself to others. But of course, you know, as you know, we're all on our own journey. Well, I think that, I think it often becomes the, the challenge. Alan Moore likes to call this you know, when we, when we start shooting on ourselves mm-hmm. or like, I, I should be here or there or doing this or generating that much revenue or having this many clients. And, and, you know, in essence, it creates an expectations gap, right? When you say you should be at a certain place and it's different than where you are, it basically means you have an expectation of being somewhere different than where you are and expectations gaps create dissatisfaction. <laughs> so we don't, we don't, we don't like gaps between expectations and reality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love what I do. I'm grateful for what I have, but yeah, on some level it's like, well, I've been doing this a long time. Why don't I have, you know, a billion dollars in AUM or something, but you know, that's all right. So, (laughs) so I mean, how do you, you how how do you think through that or, or, or process that? Why don't you have, (laughs) how do you feel about the fact that there's not a billion dollars under management? (laughs) I just have to think about, I don't know, I I think progress is motivating, you know? So to me, it's like, okay, well, if I'm making progress, like that's fun and exciting. I think that happy clients are motivating. I think that, you know, we have just a real opportunity to, to run a business here that a lot of people don't have. So as you look back on this path, is there anything that you wish you'd done differently since... I guess kind of getting getting started on, at Raymond James, or at least you were you were on your own and had that level of of control. Like anything you you know now, you wish you could go back and tell you from ten years ago. I mean, I was probably ready to launch the RIA sooner than I did, but you know. But then again, I mean, I did it in 2016. I mean, I had twins in 2014 like how much earlier was i really going to do it yeah. <laughs> you know? so so i mean part of me is like oh you know i could have done things faster better you know but eh, could i really have so yeah i mean i just i just try and be like kind of you know forgiving on myself i mean there're definitely things that like a focus on process probably could have done sooner growing my team could have done that sooner just, you know, I, I, I like the things that I've done, but really I tend to maybe overanalyze and really think through things for like a long period of time before I actually pull the trigger. So I think that some people. I'm, I'm very familiar with the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think that some people, you know, act first, whereas, you know, maybe I could use a little bit more of that of that type of behavior. So what advice would you give to newer advisors? I guess that, that could be young or even career changer coming in as, as you did about you know, starting their firm and building their path today. My advice is don't give up, learn where you are. And I would say like, if you don't like where you are, you can move on. That's hard. Just remember if you don't like where you are, you can move on. Yeah. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast around success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is just the word success means different things to different people. So you know, you, you've had this successful path building to a $50 million practice and it's, it's chugging forward. You've got a, I know still a long timeline to go from here of continuing to compound however far you, you decide you want to compound. But how do you define success for yourself at this point? I mean, success, you know, it's freedom. You know, it's financial freedom. It's financial freedom for me. It's happy clients who appreciate us and 
recommend us a team. You know, I, I would say I said progress is motivating, but I think like growth is, is success. Like I, uh, you know, I always want to feel like I'm growing, learning, you know, expanding like every year. That's, that's success. If I do it like a little bit better each year, each quarter, that's success. And, and what comes next for you? I want to grow the team. You know, I, I definitely, and I, and, and I think that there's an opportunity in this environment right now that I think that it's, there could be people who are looking to, to join, you know, another fee only advisor. So I want to grow the team and grow my practice and, and really grow. I think, you know, coming like right now in 2020, I'm in a lot better position to grow exponentially than I was in 2009. In 2009, I was really just getting started in the business and, you know, a little bit deer in the headlights. Well, now now is like a do-over for me. Yeah, I do feel like there's an interesting phenomenon here for a subset of us that have been around long enough to have gone through the last bear market and and sort of know what what it takes to hunker down and survive. But then the opportunities that come in the other end, if you're well positioned for that growth, that I'm seeing a lot more firms ready to come out swinging <laughs> on this for growth than the financial crisis, which I feel like had a much more just hunkered down survival mode mentality for the industry. Yeah. 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 I want to, I want to grow and like, you know, like you said, come out, I don't know, come out swinging, I guess, but, but, you know, th- like I said, you know, maybe I've been too hesitant before. Well, I want to, you know, take those chances now because, you know, we're, we're ready. Well, very cool. Well, I'm excited to see how it goes for you from here. I may have you back again in a couple of years to talk about how 2020 was that transition point where <laughs> we started hiring up and firing all cylinders coming out of the, the coronavirus pandemic recession. Yep. Yep. We'll try. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you, Michael. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the member section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.